Trina, hey girl, hey. Oh, Trina. Listen, you know the other day when I was um okay, YouTube live. Listen, great rising, great rising. Remember the other day I was um I forget what I was talking about, but I was asking, I was trying to remember the name of National Treasure, right? You remember that? And you responded, you thought I was talking about the Da Vinci Code, but I was talking about National Treasure. Do you know I watched it for the first time last night? My mama called me, she said, I think you might want to watch this. Matter of fact, she, she texted me, she said, have you ever seen the Da Vinci Code? I was walking on the treadmill, you know, um, I didn't see her, uh, her text, so she called me. She said, hey. You seen the Da Vinci Code? I said, uh, it sounds for me, but I don't think so. She said, you might want to watch it. <laughs> so, what, while I was on the treadmill, I went ahead and I cut it on. Yo, this movie, um, shucks, this was made, this movie is old. It was, I didn't even look at the year, but at, it was like the early 2000s when it came out. The whole reason for saying that, Trina, is, uh, listen here, have you watched it recently? Or you just kind of like, Remember remember the name of it and thought that's what I was talking about. Like, have you watched it recently? Because when I put that on, how about they give you so much truth in that movie that if you are still asleep and you're still in the church, you can completely miss it. It is what we've been talking about for the last couple of years. I'm just like, what? I'm like, it clearly, because we just waking up, right? We still, baby, we just waking up, eyes getting light. <laughs> And it's like, they've been put, look, they put the truth out here in plain sight. Let me tell you what it said. I'm just kind of sum it up real quick. Okay, so what they started, they started, they started talking about, um, you, you just got to watch it. They started talking about uh, the Constantine era, right? And everybody, every, clearly everybody here should know who Constantine is, right? And so we, we know Constantine by the... Um, the famous replacement theology, right? Constantine did a lot of stuff in his day, but also what he, I mean, like, I knew this, but it's like, when I saw it in the movie, and they just put it out there and just, boom, here you go, like, plain truth, and like, they just, it was like, what? Couldn't be. He said, absolutely, this, 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 and so I, I was like, oh, wait a minute, that's right. Listen, the deception was so, let me tell you something, okay, let me just get right to it instead of beating around the bush, but y'all gotta go watch it. They pretty much tell you. They said that here's how he was how it started. Grand Rising, Grand Rising. He said, "Listen, they they were after this ancient artifact, right? They were after this ancient uh thing, and so in the midst of this, probably I say probably about mm, thirty minutes into the movie, they get to this part and they start talking about the Last Supper, right? The the picture of the Last Supper, and um he talks, so he just he's trying to wake the the woman up." To pay attention to what's really happening. And she's like, what? And she he asked her questions like, well, you know, she said, well, this is this. He said, no, that's what they want you to believe this is. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? And I looked at it. Of course, I'm looking at it while I'm watching the movie. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, okay. I see the same thing I always saw. But he pointed out something. You know what I did? I stopped the movie. And I went and looked up every picture that I could find on the last stuff. I'm like, God darn it. I'm like, how do we miss this all these years, right? So, anyway, the whole point of bringing all that up, the main point I want to tell you about, uh, Dana, ooh, the Da Vinci Code. Listen, so what they said, they started talking about Constantine, right? So they, they was in this era with Rome and stuff taking over. And then they was like, well, the people here, they, they worshiping multiple gods. And here's what threw the uproar. This was through the uproar in the mix. They said, here come this Jewish kid talking about there is only one God. And they shouldn't be worshiping all these idol gods and stuff. And he said, can you guess who that was? I'm like... Boy, he hit that right on it. I was like, oh. I said, people ain't paying attention. He said, who? He said, everybody knows the name. He said, everybody talks about it. But what they don't understand is true history. I'm like, go ahead and say it. When he, when he was saying that, as he was describing it before he dropped the name, I said, go ahead and say it. Go ahead and say it. I know what you're about to say. He said, Jesus Christ. I said, God 
there and they've been putting the truth out here in movies all this time. I said, do what I tell y'all. What I say, I say, even your Christ that you worship is telling you to worship only God, right? There is only one God. So that's what through the uproar, people wanted to worship who they wanted to worship. And they said, listen, before this, 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 they said, <laughs> Jesus was never divine. He was a human being. You know, I was like, if you don't preach, you better tell them. <laughs> I'm yelling at the I'm yelling at my phone screen and stuff. I'm like, Father, all this stuff you didn't taught me and took me by the hand and taught me over the last three years. It's then been out here in a movie that it's just like you know, it's just kind of look over stuff. And even then, I wouldn't have caught it. I wouldn't have paid attention to it for real. They put so much bitter truth in that movie right there. And then of course, you know, they gotta add some fluff on it. They got to add a little bit of fluff on it and to make you think, oh, it's all theatrics. No, my G. If you know the truth, you'll understand how they put the truth. And now as I see, there I'm telling you, they, they started talking about a little bit how um, they created it. Shalom, shalom. That was, it. go, watch, if you've if you seen it, Dana, you need to go watch it again. Because you were completely asleep when you watched it the first time or the first few times you watched it. You never caught it. I almost during there fell off the treadmill last night while I was walking, watching this movie. I called my mama. I said, she said, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm going to watch it again today. I'm like, wait a, wait a minute. Look, it opens up showing you because it is tom hanks in it now he's the um he's the 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 great uh language research i forget his title whatever but it starts off with the um with like this conference he's at and he's speaking and he's showing clips and he said i want to teach you he pretty much talking about he's going to teach y'all something about language and images and pictures and stuff and how the pretty much how the mind and how people can be trained to to look at something and be taught and can be taught a complete lie about it. He said, but I'm going to take you back to the origins of when all of this stuff first began. I'm like, boy, you better go ahead and preach up here in this movie, <laughs> right? And so he started showing pictures. He said, what is this? They said, oh, that's the baby Jesus. He said, no, this is Horace. And he started, I was like, oh, you know, because he showed like, he showed just like a little piece of the picture. And then, uh, because Oh gosh, it it was so good the way that they did this in the beginning because the pictures that he showed is like the pictures that you see in Christianity. But when he blows up the bigger picture so you can see the full picture of what was there, it shows you clearly this came from another era where he wasn't even thought about, right? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway from that movie, the biggest bit of truth is... Because me, me, me and my sister, as we was going through this, was like, wait a minute. Okay, so, I mean, this was like, uh, like I remember la early last year, um, early last year, we was talking about this. We was going back and forth. And we, we was at this point, I was like, okay, well, who was he really? I said, did he even exist? I said, okay, uh, if he existed, he clearly wasn't this God that people now worship like we was going through all these steps like our checklist like wait a minute okay we need to verify this this here 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 right and so the whole here here's the whole thing after he had died or whatever that you, you just got to listen to it and how they talk about it what they did they they made him divine right they made him divine and then they started because the people they wanted to they did this whole thing of inclusion everybody wanted to worship who they wanted to worship and constantine was the ruler he said well look we're gonna bring peace but we're gonna kind of put it all into one just if y'all understand what replacement theology is right we're gonna make this this way everybody can worship together and if you think about some of the stuff that you see now this church with all the different religions coming together one world religion it's literally literally the same thing you can see it everywhere right but i think the biggest bit of truth that they dropped in that movie <laughs> that i can clearly verify myself based on all the research that i've done just <laughs> since i started waking up over the last three years is about this is the biggest takeaway the biggest truth that they drop in there they said this young kid came on the scene disrupting everything telling everybody that there is only one god and they should worship only one god right <laughs> they had to do away with him 
they had to do away with him. Same thing now. I was like, oh my gosh. And so I began to think about some of the things. I was like, oh, this, this woman how we was talking about this is a strong delusion. It is a deep, deep, deep deception, people. And the truth is out there. And when you and when you're a Christian and you see the truth, like I said, if your heart is really not to worship you and you alone, you stay asleep. You miss all the truth that passed by your face all day long. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Y'all, if y'all haven't seen it or if y'all have seen it before, like I would say since, as long as I've been here uh, the last three years. If, you, if it's been over three years since you've watched The Da Vinci Code, you might want to go watch that again. Watch it today if you got some free time. But anyway, I know this was a conversation between me and Trina. Because I was reminding her of what she had said. I hadn't thought about it. I'd never seen it. I wasn't even talking about the Da Vinci Code. I was talking about National Treasure. So when my mama texted me last night, then when she called me, I said, wait a minute. Trina mentioned that the other day. She thought I was talking about that when I was talking about National Treasure. And it was second time it's coming. I was like, oh, so. And listen, my mom watches from YouTube. Trina is on Facebook. <laughs> Never have the two twain, right? No, I'm sorry. Never have the twain <laughs> mixed. So she she would not have seen Trina's comment, right? So I'm just like, ah. Uh. So, but anyway, y'all got to go watch that. And, and, rem and remember, there is some leaven added in. Uh, uh, leaven is purposely added to places that gives you the truth. Then it gives you the leaven. So now you got to kind of go through, okay, what's truth? What's error? You can clearly find out the truth that's there but sometimes this other stuff seems a little too convincing where you have to go back and do a little bit more work to truly verify if this is leaven or it does it have some truth to it if it has some truth to it what is the actual truth about this thing right so but i think the leaven that they added in they give you the truth but the little bit of leaven that they add in as they begin to unravel the story i believe it's another way that if you sleep to still kind of keep you asleep and still kind of get you off the right road but they clearly tell you what the right road is but they want to kind of guide you down another road which is not back to this road right what what he was originally saying so y'all gotta watch it i ain't gonna tell y'all no more than that go watch it and then y'all let me know when y'all watch it come back and comment on this video or something if you're on facebook or if you're on youtube if you got my personal phone number Call us, text me, inbox me. Let me know what you think. See if you done figured it out. Okay, y'all. Anyway, it is it's who y'all. It is Sunday, February the twenty first, twenty twenty one, day eighty three of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three year consecutive day count day seven hundred and fifty two. Today we are reading Deuteronomy. 13, 14, and 15, and then we're going to hop over into the Legends of the Jews on page 328. We got the same size book as I do, and pick up where we left off yesterday. But first, let's get started here with the shimmer. Top of the day, everybody who is here, Belinda Brown, Josiah Jones, James Brown, Dana Tiffany, Trina, Levine, Shayla. Seeing somebody else. Hold on, somebody need to come. Uncle Nathaniel, greetings. Okay, y'all. And there's more people here. They just don't comment, which is cool, which is fine. All right, y'all. So, yeah. oh, I gotta do that. I pulled this up. Okay. The Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And remember, Deuteronomy chapter 6, when I read it, is I'm reading. Like a condensed version. I'm not reading the whole chapter. I'm reading the meat of it. And then I'm skipping down to the ending part of it. But you should read the entire chapter. I had even considered <laughs> starting reading the entire chapter in the morning. But it's 25 verses. But y'all should just go read it yourself. I'm trying to get the meat of it. And just boom. But it gives more detail about um, the shimmer and what we should be doing. Right? Okay. I'm just trying to get y'all attention first thing in the morning. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily as Yahuwah, the God of our fathers, has promised us in the land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God, he is one God, and you shall love Yahuwah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. 
And you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Yahuwah our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if... We observe to do all these commandments before you who are God, as he has promised us. All right, beautiful people. So let's pick it up here. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Yo, this is one of the best chapters in this book that will keep you, Kenneth Shalom, Shalom, that will keep you from being drug along by <laughs> vagabond prophets and seers and those who always talking about they dream dreams and always got a revelation i don't doubt that they, that you who speaks to you oh trina yes please do send me send it to me okay all right so here's how listen now i know i'm a dreamer so i have to tread very carefully because i understand how this uh this gift can get people off right like if you don't stay close to the most holy you you can be in very grave danger so these gifts have to be protected and submitted to you at all times right okay listen it's a warning against idolatry suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles and they predicted signs or miracles will occur. If they then say, come, let us worship other gods. Gods you have not known before, do not listen to them. Matter of fact, here's another test where we can slap on <laughs> to the New Testament or where we can take it with us when we go walk through it to kind of weed out the leaven that has been added into the loaf and not just Deuteronomy 13 but also Deuteronomy 18 it's a test and even when we hear people talking to us you it it's it would behoove us to go against the true sounding board which is Yahuwah himself listen suppose there I'm gonna start it over I was I was only on at the end of verse 2 suppose there are prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles. And they predict that signs or miracles will occur. If they then say, come, let us worship other gods. Gods you have not known before. Do not listen to them. Yahuwah, your God, is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart, with all your soul. So what is that telling us? That he will allow prophets and dreamers to speak and to dream things simply to test you to see if you want to obey what he said or this great deception that's coming out the lives of prophets and dreamers right listen if what the prophets and the dreamers are saying are not lining up with what yahuwah himself has said you might be in a bit of trouble if you take that advice and you operate on that advice, so that's why I'm very careful. I need to, I, I, I run my, I don't tell y'all a lot of my dreams. There's no point in doing that because a lot of them, they aren't for you, right? Some of them, they're, they're, they're personal. And then some of them I get that are for like the nation, but it's like, how am I going to get that out to them? But I have to, all of them run them against the sounding board of what you who has said and i take them and i go through the scripture okay what is this is this for now should i say this now yeah mm. listen if they then say come let us worship other gods gods you have not known before do not listen to them you who your god is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart with all your soul serve only you who are your god and fear him alone obey his commands listen to his voice and cling to him the false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death for they encourage rebellion against you who are your god who redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of egypt since they try to lead you away from Yahuwah, your god 
oh i left out a word since they tried to lead you astray from the way your who or your god commanded you to live you must put them to death in this way you will purge the evil from among you now we know clearly to in today's world we can't just go out here murdering people that um that is <laughs> leading us astray because we ourselves don't go to jail so we have to wait for the most holy to root them out of this place right listen suppose someone secretly entices you even your brother your son or daughter your beloved wife or your closest friend and says let us go worship other gods gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known here's a good indication of who we should and should not be worshiping our ancestors abraham isaac and jacob who did they worship was they calling on multiple names were they worshiping multiple gods in the bible as we read who did they only talk to who did they only worship who did they only teach their children to worship these are the right questions suppose someone secretly entices you even your brother, your son or daughter, your beloved wife or your closest friend, and says, let us go worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your ancestors have known. They might suggest that you worship the gods of the peoples who live nearby or who come from the ends of the earth. But do not give in or listen. Have no pity and do not spare or protect them. You must put them to death. Strike the first blow yourself, and then all the people must join in. Stone the guilty ones to death because they have tried to draw you away from your who are your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, a place, the place of slavery. Then all Israel will hear about it and be afraid, and no one will act so wickedly again. It's like my mama be saying, all it takes is one good public flogging. The most we can do here in our day without laying hands on folk is actually speaking the truth. We can deal death blows to this deception when we constantly speak the truth that there is only one God. Even the person that the church is now teach that the church now teaches people to worship, the person who came to turn their affections back to the most holy, they have now turned their affections to him. And after he died, they began to worship him like he was God. And that is the prevailing teaching in the church. That is not even what he preached out of his mouth, right? Y'all gotta pay attention. When you begin to live in the towns, who your God is giving you. You may hear that scoundrels among you are leading their fellow citizens astray by saying, Let us go worship other gods, gods you have not known before. In such cases, you must examine the facts carefully. If you find that the report is true and such a detestable act has been committed among you, you must attack that town and completely destroy all its inhabitants as well as all the livestock. Then you must pile all the plunder in the middle of the open square and burn it. Burn the entire town as a burnt offering to you who are your God. That town must remain a ruin forever. It may never be rebuilt. Keep none of the plunder that has been set apart for destruction. Then Yahuwah will turn his fierce anger and be merciful to you. He will have compassion on you and make you a large nation. Just as he swore to your ancestors. For Yahuwah your God will be merciful only if you listen to his voice and keep all his commandments that I'm giving you today. Doing what pleases him. That's the test, my beautiful people. I know the deception is deep. And when you come out of deception, you tend to still take that same God with you. And you just change his name and throw a Hebrew name on top of him. You are still wrong, my friends. And I know, I was there. It's levels of waking up and you got to com completely output all the gods away. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Since you are the people of you who are your God, never cut yourselves or shave the hair above your foreheads in the morning. In I'm sorry. Since you are the people of you who are your God, never cut yourselves or shave the hair above your foreheads in mourning for the dead. 
You have been set apart as holy to Yahuwah your God, and he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. You must not eat any detestable animals that are ceremonially unclean. These are the animals that you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roe deer, the wild goat, the addicts, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. You may eat any animal that has completely split hooves and chews the cud. But if the animal doesn't have both, it may not be eaten. So you may not eat the camel, the hare, or the hyrax. They chew the cud but do not have split hooves, so they are ceremonially unclean for you. You may not eat the pig. It has split hooves but does not chew the cud. It is ceremonially unclean for you. And you may not eat the pig. It has split hooves and does not chew the cud. So it is ceremonially unclean for you. And you may not eat the pig. It has split hooves but does not chew the cud. So it is ceremonially unclean for you. You may not eat the meat of these animals or even touch their carcasses. Of all the marine animals, you may eat whatever has both fins and scales. You may not, however, eat marine animals that do not have both fins and scales. They are ceremonially unclean for you. You may eat any bird that is ceremonially clean. These are the birds you may not eat. The griffin vulture, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon buzzards of all kinds, ravens of all kinds, the eagle owl, the short-eared owl, the seagull, hawks of all kinds, the little owl, the gray owl, the barn owl, the desert owl, the Egyptian vulture, the cormorant, the stork, herons of all kinds, the hoopoe, and the bat, and the bat, and the bat. And did y'all know I just found out <laughs> earlier this year that the turkey comes from the vulture family Blech. oh my gosh oh. all winged insects that walk along the ground are ceremonially unclean for you and you may not and may not be eaten but you may eat any winged bird or insect that is ceremonially clean you must not eat anything that has died a natural death. You may give it to a foreigner living in your town, or you may sell it to a stranger. But do not eat it yourselves, for you are set apart as holy to Yahuwah your God. You must not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. You must set aside as a tithe of your crops, one-tenth, of all the crops you harvest each year, bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place Yahuwah your God chooses for his name to be honored. Eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you all ways to fear Yahuwah. Now, when Yahuwah your God blesses you with a good harvest, now, when Yahuwah your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring the tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money in a pouch, and go to the place Yahuwah your God has chosen. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want cattle, sheep, goats, wine, and other alcoholic drink. Then feast there in the presence of Yahuwah your God and celebrate with your household. Do not neglect the Levites in your town, for they will receive no allotment of land among you. And I kept bringing out, um, <laughs> he started laughing. Oh, bro, I'm telling you. Listen, I was extra when I was bringing your attention to when I said may use the money because sometimes we are taught in church that the tithe is money and it's not necessarily true right there's always this big argument going back and forth and people that don't read 
don't even realize that Yahuwah names both of these, the monetary things, actual money, and the tithe. There's a separation between the two. He said, matter of fact, if the place where I call y'all to come worship is too far for you to get to, and you got too much stuff to carry, you may actually sell your tithe in exchange for money that you can carry right and then when you get to the place you can repurchase everything that you have sold right you want it to lighten the load for him he said but even if you can't get this far this i'm gonna read it again pay attention y'all this is these some of these little these little things that we get hung up on and it's answered if we would just go read it ourselves listen i'm and i had like two verses left but i'm gonna go back up to 22 and i just read it all through so pay attention this time y'all you must set aside a tithe of your crops so actually those of us who have gardens and stuff now we can actually uh begin practicing some of this right i just give mine to when i get it i give it to somebody who need it right okay listen you must set aside a tithe of your crops one tenth of all the crops you harvest each year bring this tithe to the designated place of worship the place Yahuwah your God chooses for his name to be honored and eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you always to fear Yahuwah your God. Now, when Yahuwah your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring the tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money into a pouch, and go to the place Yahuwah your God has chosen. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other alcoholic drink. Then feast there in the presence of Yahuwah your God and celebrate with your household. And do not neglect the Levites in your town, for they will receive no allotment of land from among you. At the end of every third year, bring the entire tithe of that year's harvest and store it in the nearest town. Give it to the Levites who will receive no allotment of land among you, as well as the foreigners living among you, the orphans and the widows in your towns, so that they can eat and be satisfied. Then Yahuwah your God will bless you in all your work. All right, y'all. Last chapter for the day. Over here before we hop over to the Legends of the Jews. Deuteronomy chapter 15. At the end of every seventh year, you must cancel the debts of everyone who owes you money. This is how it must be done. Everyone must cancel the loans they made for their fellow Israelites. They must not demand payment from their neighbors or relatives for Yahuwah's time of release has arrived. This release from debt, however, applies only to your fellow Israelite, not to the foreigners living among you. There should be no poor among you. For Yahuwah your God will greatly bless you in the land he is giving you as a special possession. You will receive this blessing if you are careful to obey all the commands of Yahuwah your God that I am giving you today. Yahuwah your God will bless you as he has promised. You will lend money to many nations but will never need to borrow. You will rule many nations but they will not rule over you. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns, when you arrive in the land Yahuwah your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Instead, be generous and lend to them whatever they need. Do not be, do not be mean-spirited and refuse someone a loan because the year for counseling debts is close at hand. If you refuse to make the loan and the needy person cries out to Yahuwah, you will be considered guilty of sin. Give generously to the poor, not grudgingly. For Yahuwah your God will bless you in everything you do. There will always be some in the land who are poor. This is why I am commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other Israelites in need. It would do us well to remember that. Right? And a lot of us do. Um... And sometimes it's a lot better to give to somebody on the streets than to put your money in the church somewhere. It really is. Those are just my personal thoughts. Right? 
All right. If a fellow Hebrew sells himself or herself to be your servant and serves you for six years, in the seventh year, you must set that servant free. When you release a male servant, do not send him away empty-handed. Give him a generous farewell gift from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Share with him some of the bounty with which Yahuwah your God has blessed you. Remember that you were once slaves in the land of Egypt, and Yahuwah your God redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this command. But suppose your servant says, I will not leave you because he loves you and your family and he has done well with you. In that case, take an owl and push it through his earlobe into the door. After that, he will be your servant for life and do the same thing for your female servants. Tom, he said, go ahead and pierce his ear. We walk around here like it's fashion piercing everything you must not consider it a hardship oh my gosh i just had like a whole <laughs> revelation right there maybe me want to snatch my earrings out oh father in heaven listen wow okay you must not consider it a hardship when you release your servants remember that for six years they have been given they have been giving you services worth double the wages of hired workers and yahuwah your god will bless you in all you do you must set aside for yahuwah your god all the firstborn males from your flocks and herds do not use the firstborn of your herds to work your fields and do not shear the firstborn of your flocks instead you and your family must eat these animals in the presence of Yahuwah your God each year at the place he chooses. But if this firstborn animal has any defect, such as lameness or blindness, or if anything else with, is wrong with it, you must not sacrifice it to Yahuwah your God. Instead, use it for food for your family in your hometown. Anyone, whether ceremonially clean or unclean, may eat it, just as anyone may eat a gazelle or a deer. But you must not consume the blood. You must pour it out on the ground like water. All right, beautiful people. Let's go ahead and hop over here to the legends of the Jews and pick up what we left off at yesterday. Page three. Oh, we're about to get into the rebellion of Korah. Oh my gosh, y'all, this is so good. <laughs> Remember, I was telling y'all about this before. Okay, this is the last little section before we get over there. We start in chapter five. Oh, if y'all ain't listened to the rebellion of Korah, I'm so glad we're coming upon this section. Okay, this last little uh, section here in chapter four. The years of this favor, um, page 328, if you have the same book I do. Although Yahuwah had now counsel his resolution to annihilate israel he was not yet quite reconciled with them and they were out of favor during the following years of their march through the desert and was made and was made evident by several circumstances during these years of this favor the north wind did not blow with the result that the boys who were born in the desert could not be circumcised as the absence of the wind produced an excessively high temperature, a condition that made it very dangerous for the young boys to have this operation performed upon them. As the law, however, prohibits the offering of the Passover lamb unless the boys have been circumcised, Israel could not properly, properly observe the feast of Passover. I'm sorry, I'm tongue tied already. Listen, okay. As the law, however, prohibits the offering of the Passover lamb, unless the boys have been circumcised, Israel could not properly observe the feast of Passover after the incident of the spies. Moses also felt the effects of the disfavor, for during this time he received from Yahuwah none but the absolute essential directions and no other revelations. This was because Moses, like all other prophets, received this distinction only for the sake of Israel. And when Israel was in disgrace, Yahuwah did not communicate with him 
affectionately. Oh my, I just thought about something. Remember, look, we just read about the test of the prophets and the dreamers, right? Listen, it's like a, it, this is like, a, this is like a whole, <laughs> listen, hold on. Moses also felt the effects of the disfavor. For during this time, he received from you who were none but the absolutely essential directions and no other revelations, right? Listen, and I said that because I think about now some of these prophets that prophesy and dream all the time. And I was like, Father, can you be speaking this much? You don't speak to me this much. I'm like, I, they got a word like every day. They got a dream like every day. And although I think I dream a lot, I don't dream like every day. Like they, they uploading videos every single day with dreams and stuff right remember we're still in the land of our captivity and what is the absolute essentials for us right at this time and so when we go astray we won't get nothing but the absolute essentials what you supposed to do repent and turn back to y'all that it literally will be our own repent turn back to y'all worship him only right and as we begin to do that other things will begin to come to us listen i'm gonna keep on reading Moses also felt the effects of this favor. For during this time, he received from you who were none but the absolutely essential directions and no other revelations. This was because Moses, like all other prophets, received this distinction only for the sake of Israel. And when Israel was in disgrace, Yahuwah did not communicate with him affectionately. Indeed, Moses' fate to die in the desert without entering the promised land had been decreed simultaneously with the fate of the generation led by him out of Egypt. But the most terrible punishment of all fell upon the spies who with their wicked tongues had brought about the whole disaster. Yahuwah repaid them measure for measure. We can balance the scales on y'all. Listen. But the most terrible punishment fell upon all the spies who with their wicked tongues had brought about the whole disaster. You who repaid them measure for measure. Their tongues stretched so great a length that they touched the navel. Oh my gosh, I got to read this. Listen. <laughs> their tongues stretched so great a length that they touched the navel and worms crawled out of their tongues and pierced the navel and pierced the navel in this horrible fashion did these men die oh uh, they used that tongue so that tongue that tongue had to bear the burden of its sin measure for measure joshua and caleb however who had remained true to you who had not followed the wicked counsel of their colleagues were not only exempted from death but were furthermore rewarded by Yahuwah by receiving in the Holy Land the property that had been allotted to the other spies. Caleb was 40 years of age at the time when he was sent out as a spy. He had married early and at the age of 10 begot a son. Still at the age of 85, he was sturdy enough to enjoy his possession in the Holy Land. Yahuwah's mercy is also extended to sinners. Hence, he bade Moses to say to the people, The Amalekites and the Canaanites are now dwelling in the valley. Tomorrow, turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Yahuwah did this because he had firmly resolved in the event of a war between Israel and the inhabitants of Palestine, not to aid the former, knowing that in this cast their annihilation was sure. He commanded them to make no attempt to enter the land by force. It had been my intention, said Yahuwah, to exalt you. But now if you were to attempt to make war upon the inhabitants of Palestine, you would suffer humiliation. The people did, however, the people did not, however, hearken to the words of Yahuwah that Moses communicated to them and all at once formed in battle array in order to advance against the Amorites. They thought that after they had confessed their sin of having been misled by the spies, 
Yuhu will stand by them in their battles. So they said to Moses, Surely these few drops have not filled the bucket. Their <laughs> Surely these few drops have not filled the bucket. Their transgression against Yuhu will seem to them only a picadillo. Hold on. Is that the right word? Picadillo. Okay. Their transgression against Yuhu will seem to them only a peccadillo that had long since been forgiven. They were, however, mistaken. Like bees, the enemy swarmed down upon them, and whereas these had in former times fallen dead of fright upon hearing the names of the Israelites, now a blow from them sufficed to kill the Israelites. Their attempt to wage war without the holy ark in their midst proved a miserable failure many of them as the loafer had among these met their death and as many others turned returned to camp covered with wounds the wailing and weeping of the people was of no avail yahuwah persisted in his resolve and though they brought upon themselves grace punishment for this new proof of disobedience to yahuwah for this new hold on and though they brought upon themselves grave punishment for this new proof of disobedience, for Yahuwah said to Moses, If I were to deal with them now in accordance with strict justice, they should never enter the land. After a while, however, I will let them possess the land which I swore unto their fathers to give unto them in order to comfort and encourage Israel <clears throat> in their dejection. Moses received directions to announce the law of sacrifices and other precepts laid down for the life in the Holy Land. That the people might see Yahuwah did not mean to be angry with them forever. When Moses announced the laws to them, a dispute between the Israelites and the proselytes, because the former declared that they alone and not the others were to make the offerings to Yahuwah in his sanctuary. Yahuwah hereupon called Moses and said to him, Why do these always quarrel with one another? Moses replied, Thou knowest why, Yahuwah. Have I not said to thee, One law and one ordinance shall be for you and for the stranger that sojourneth with you? Although the forty years march through the desert <clears throat> was a punishment for the sin of Israel, still it had one advantage. At the time when Israel departed from Egypt, Palestine was in poor condition. The trees planted in the times of Noah were old and withered. Hence, Yahuwah said, What shall I permit Israel to enter an uninhabitable land? I shall bid them to wander in the desert for 40 years, that the Canaanites may in the meantime fell the old trees and plant new ones so that Israel upon entering the land may find it abounding in plenty. So did it come to pass, for when Israel conquered Palestine, they found the land not only newly cultivated, but also filled to overflowing with treasures. And also, <clears throat> we read, yeah, shucks, this, I guess it was last week sometime, when they heard that Israel was coming, they began tearing everything up right there were so many things and so many reasons that you allowed them to wander in the desert that it'll blow your mind when they heard they was coming they said they ain't getting this land so we're gonna tear it all up and you saw that he said so he let them stay out there that much longer in the wilderness so that they would have to repair everything that they tore up right they would much rather tear this place down than to hand it over to you people pay attention to what's going on even now people everywhere everywhere because remember the righteous inherit the earth and every all the all the lands of the enemy although we will be taken back to our promised land we will once again inhabit those places you who as people will also be dispersed and a lot of them will disperse everywhere now but we're going to have the rule over all the lands right and we're going to rule in righteousness and watch this gradual process as it keeps going it's starting now y'all y'all gotta pay attention pay attention where we see great catastrophes happening places being torn down even by nat uh like disasters and stuff 
people coming down out of positions. All of these positions are being left open. Why? So the righteous can move right on in and take these seats, right? Even businesses and stuff. A lot of things are being shut down. Yahuwah's people are getting businesses and grabbing things for pennies on a dollar. People giving up places trying to flee here. It's going to be another market crash, but it's going to be a great time of freedom for Yahuwah's people. Grab it all up. We're going to get everything. What happened? Egypt was about to be destroyed. It's the same thing. Everything that like, give us all your stuff. We're taking all your we taking all your stuff. They couldn't use it. Great catastrophe was coming upon them. They were scared for their life. They only wanted to live. What well, y'all fearing for your life? And we got the celestial light <laughs> guiding and guarding us. Give me your stuff, G. We ain't got that. We saw it when it was dark. You who let us see in your house? It's hidden right there in your kitchen in that third cabinet from the left. No, not that one. The side that the wall is painted, that the accent wall, the blue accent wall. To the left in that cabinet, third shelf behind that pot, and they like, Here, <laughs> I'm telling boy, this about to get so good. Look, listen, hold on, let me go back up here. Hold on. I was, oh, did I finish? I think I read everything. No, I didn't. Okay, listen. Although the 40 years march through the desert was a punishment for the sin of Israel, still it had one advantage. At the time when Israel departed from Egypt, Palestine was in poor condition. The trees planted in the time of Noah were old and withered. Hence, Yahuwah said, What shall I permit Israel to enter in uninhabitable land? I shall bid them wander in a desert for 40 years that the Canaanites in the meantime may fell the old trees or cut down the old trees and plant new ones so that Israel upon entering the land may find it abounding in plenty. So did it come to pass for when Israel conquered Palestine, they found the land not only newly cultivated, but also filled to overflowing with treasures. The inhabitants of this land were such misers that they would not indulge in a drop of oil for their gruel. If an egg broke, they did not use it, but sold it for cash. The hoardings of these miserly Canaanites, Yahuwah, gave, Yahuwah later gave to Israel to enjoy and use. Okay, y'all. About to start chapter 5. Korah's rebellion through Balak, king of Moab. The rebellion of Korah. Oh, y'all. The Canaanites were not the only ones who did not enjoy their wealth and money. For a similar fate was decreed for Korah. He had been the treasurer of Pharaoh and possessed treasures so vast that he employed 300 white mules to carry the keys of his treasures. But let not the rich man boast of his riches, for Korah, through his sin, lost both life and property. Korah had obtained possession of his riches in the following way. When Joseph, during the lean years, through the sale of grain, amassed great treasures, he erected three great buildings, 100 cubits wide, 100 cubits long, and 100 cubits wide, 100 high, filled them with money, and delivered them to Pharaoh, being too honest to leave even five silver shekels of this money to his children. Korah discovered one of these three treasuries. On the account of his wealth, he became proud, and his pride brought about his fall. He believed Moses had slighted him by appointing his cousin Elizaphan as chief of the Levite division of the Kohathites. He said, my grandfather had four sons, Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Amram, as the firstborn, had the privileges of which his sons availed themselves. For Aaron is the high priest, and Moses is king. But have, I, but have not I, the son of Ishar, the second son of Kohath, the rightful claim to be prince of the Kohathites? Mo Moses, however... Passed me, passed me by and appointed Elizaphan, whose father was Uziel, 
the youngest son of my grandfather. Therefore will I now stir up rebellion against Moses and overthrow all institutions founded by him. Let me just say something here. I, we done read it quite a few times. But every time I read it, it's just like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Listen, Moses was their king. And you got to look at it, right? From the time, because we don't read it as such, we don't, it, and it's there. And it, you don't really need to bring a lot of attention to it. But Moses was the, the, the Messiah. Here, here is, I want to make sure I say this the right way. You got to understand the, I guess the job, the job description and the duties of those who are called the Messiah of Yahuwah's people or the deliverer of Yahuwah's people or the human person in place as Yahuwah's representative to lead his people out. Yahuwah is the Messiah of his people, right? It's He is the Messiah. He then chooses a person out of the generation that he is going to lead out of captivity. He's going to talk to them, fill them with his wisdom and power, all kinds of stuff. And it's not just boom, we drop it on you, but it's a progression of their entire life, right? And so he thoroughly trains them to take this position, right? Yahuwah doesn't drop any kind of novice into any kind of position to lead people, right? If we understand this about Yahuwah and we can see it all the way through the scripture, how Yahuwah works, right? How he deals with us, um, we will see that he still operates in the same fashion, right? So Moses was, in fact, their king. And if we if we go read in the book of Jasher, we'll also see that when Moses fled from Egypt after he had killed the Egyptian, Moses was king. I think we actually read that part before we jumped over here to the legends of the Jews. But all before he went back, he was the king. He was a king in Africa, right? And he ruled. And he ruled very well. And the people loved him. He ruled well. So Yahuwah trained him. He raised him up in the family of the people who he was later going to destroy. He taught them all their ways. All the tricks and the trades. Moses knew all she had in places, right? I know it's bad, but only family. A couple people in my family may get that. <laughs> she ain't in none of she hiding places. But anyway, Moses knew all they had in places, everything, because they, he was trained by them. And then Yahuwah took him, he separated him, and he trained him again on much higher levels. And all of his training, he brought together. And thus, Yahuwah himself, although Israel all, and the whole point of saying this, although Israel always cried out for a king, Yahuwah had already given them a king, so to speak. But this human king was always, should have always been fully submitted to him. Where it's Yahuwah that's calling the shots, and he's pretty much just... Um, relaying the orders to the people, right? Because <clears throat> remember, at first he didn't want to do that. He wanted himself to give the orders to everybody. But they kind of killed that <clears throat> when he spoke to them and they flew back 12 miles. Like, listen here, Moses, you go talk to him and then you come back and you tell us what he said. That's where the whole king thing began, right? And you will begin to set in place, right? He said, okay, you can choose a king, but only choose the king that I set apart right so moses was indeed the king of israel during this time right okay so i just i just want to bring it out just i mean nothing really big but just kind of pay attention to it right and you can see it all through the scriptures with the different deliverers or messiahs even think about uh, nehemiah all all the different ages right but you have to also look at what they did they actually did something they didn't just show up and say, boom, I'm king. Don't do anything. Don't lead anybody back. Don't do. you. How How was you a king again? Hmm? You going to come back and then you going to. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That ain't the way you will operate. But. Okay. Listen. <clears throat> Moses, however, passed by me and appointed Eliza fan, whose father was Uziel, the youngest son of my grandfather. Therefore, I will now stir up rebellion against Moses and overthrow all institutions founded by him. Korah was far too wise a man to believe that Yahuwah would permit success to a rebellion against Moses. 
and stand by indifferently, but the very insight that enabled him to look into the future became his doom. He saw with his prophetic eye that Samuel, a man as great as both Aaron and Moses together, would be one of his descendants. And furthermore, that 24 descendants of his, inspired by the Holy Spirit, would compose psalms and sing them in the temple. This brilliant future of his descendants inspired him with great confidence in his undertaking. For he thought to himself that Yahuwah would not permit the father of such pious men to perish. His eye did not, however, look sharply enough into the future, for else he would have known that his sons would repent of the rebellion against Moses, and for this reason would be worthy of becoming the fathers of prophets and temple singers, whereas he was to perish in this rebellion. Oh my gosh, that you who will open our eyes again. That's that celestial light where they literally can see into the future. Not just no, you can see clearly into the future. All the Adam saw all it it, it keeps telling us Adam saw all the generations and all its leaders and all its prophets and all the expounders of the Torah and all its scribes and all the common people and all the lowly people and all the rich. He saw all of them. He saw all the way up to the day of redemption, the day, the few days of redemption, even up to the judgment day. He saw it all. Moses saw it all. Abraham saw it all. That's how they could say, they could tell them, they could bless them, right? And when Yahuwah opened the eyes of their offspring, they could begin to see. Like we get, because we're in the land of our captivity, like I said, we just get little glimpses of this. And the, the prophetic insight that we get is nothing compared to what they could see. Like that gift has not been dropped on us fully yet. Like seriously, it has not. Okay, listen. Okay, hold on. His eye <clears throat> did not, however, look sharply enough into the future, or else he would have known that his sons would repent of the rebellion against Moses and would for this reason be deemed worthy of becoming the fathers of prophets and temple singers, whereas he was to perish in this rebellion. The names of this unfortunate rebel corresponded to his deed and to his end. He was called Korah, baldness, for through his death, for through the death of his horde, he called a baldness in Israel. He was a son of Izhar, the heap of the noon, because he had caused the earth to be made to be made to boil like the heat of noon. And furthermore, he was designated as the son of Kohath, for Kohath signifies bluntness. And through his sin, he made his children's teeth to be set on edge. His description as the son of Levi, conduct, points to this end, for he was conducted to hell. Korah, however, was not the only one who strove to overthrow Moses. With him were, first of all, the Reubenites, Dathan, and Abiram, who well deserved their names. For the one signifies transgressor of the divine law, and the other, the obdurate. There were furthermore 250 men who by their rank and influence belonged to the most prominent people in Israel, among them even the princes of the tribes. And the union of the Reubenites with Korah was, a verified, was verified the proverb, Woe to the wicked, woe to his neighbor. For Korah, one of the sons of Kohath, had his station in the south of the tabernacle, and as the Reubenites were also encamped there, a friendship was struck up between them so that they followed him in his undertaking against Moses. The hatred Korah felt against Moses was still more kindled by his wife. When, after the consecration of the Levites, Korah returned home, he, his wife noticed that the hairs of his head and his body had been shaved and asked him who had done all this to him. He answered, Moses, whereupon his wife remarked, Moses hates thee and did this to disgrace thee. Korah, however, replied, Moses shaved all the hair of his own sons too. But she said, what did the disgrace of his sons matter to him 
if he only felt he could disgrace thee. He was quite ready to make that sacrifice. He was quite ready to make that sacrifice. As at home, so also did Korah fail with others. For hairless as he was, no one at first recognized him. And when the people last discovered who was before them, they asked him in astonishment who had so disfigured him. That's like you see a man all this time with a beard and he going to shave himself like, who is you? You better get out of here. <laughs> you turn to a whole different person like, wait, oh, Cora, that's you. Ooh, what happened to you? <clears throat> As at home, so also did Cora fare with others. For as hairless as he was, no one at first recognized him. And when the people at last discovered who was before them, they asked him in astonishment who had so disfigured him. In answer to their inquiries, he said, Moses did this, who besides took hold of my hands and feet to lift me. And after he had lifted me, said, Thou art clean. But his brother Aaron he adorned like a bride and bade him to take his place in the tabernacle. Embittered by what they considered as insult offered him by Moses, Korah and his people exclaimed, Moses is king. His brother did he appoint as high priest, his nephews as the head of the priest. He allots to the priest the heave offering and many other and many other tributes. Then he tried to make Moses appear ridiculous in the eyes of the people. Shortly before this, Moses had read to the people the law of the fringes and the borders of their garments. Korah now had garments of purple made for the 250 men that followed him all of whom were chief justices. Arrayed thus, Korah and his company appeared before Moses and asked him if they were required to attach fringes to the corners of these garments. Moses answered, Yea. Korah then began his argument. If, he said, one fringe of purple suffices to fulfill this commandment, should not a whole garment of purple answer the requirements of the law even if there be no special fringe of purple in the corners? He continued to lay before Moses similar artful questions. Must a mezuzah be attached to the doorpost of the house filled with the sacred books? Moses answered, Yea. Then Korah said, 270 sections of the Torah are not sufficient, whereas the two sections attached to the doorpost suffice? Moses, I'm sorry, Korah put still another question. If upon a man's skin there show a bright spot the size of half a bean, is he clean or unclean? Moses, unclean. And Korah continued, if the spot spread and cover all the skin of him, is he clean or unclean? Moses, clean. Laws so irrational, said Korah cannot possibly trace their origin from Yahuwah. The Torah that thou didst teach to Israel is not therefore Yahuwah's work, but thy work. Thou art no prophet, and Aaron is no high priest. Okay, I'm going to read this next little section. And then we're going to um, <laughs> we're gonna pick the rest of it up tomorrow. And it's entitled, Korah Abuses Moses and the Torah. Then Korah betook himself to the people to incite them to rebellion against Moses, and particularly against the tributes to the priests imposed upon them, opposed upon the people by him, that the people might now be in a position to form a proper conception of the oppressive burden to these tasks. Korah told them the following tale that he had invented: There lived in my vicinity a widow with two daughters who owned for their support a field whose yield was just sufficient for them to keep body and soul together. When this woman set out to plow her, to plow her field, Moses appeared and said, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. When she began to sow, Moses appeared and said, Thou shalt not sow with diverse seeds. When the first fruits showed in the poor widow's field, Moses appeared and bade her to bring it to the priest. For to them are due the first of all the fruit of the earth. 
And when at length the time came for him to cut it down, Moses appeared and ordered her not to wholly reap the corners of the field, not to gather the gleanings of the harvest, but to leave them for the poor. When she had done all Moses had bidden her, she was about to thrash the grain. Moses appeared once more and said, Give me the heave offerings, the first and the second tithes to the priest. When at last the poor woman became aware of the fact that she could not now possibly maintain herself from the yield of the field after the deduction of all the tributes that Moses had imposed upon her, she sold the field and with the proceeds purchased ewes in the hope that she might now undisturbed have to benefit have the benefit of the wool as well as the younglings of the sheep she however was mistaken when the firstling of the sheep was born Aaron appeared and demanded it for the firstborn belongs to the priest she had a similar experience with the wool at shearing time Aaron appeared and demanded demanded the first of the fleece of the sheep which according to Moses law was his but not content with this, he reappeared later and demanded one sheep out of every ten as a tithe, to which again, according to the law, he had a claim. Now I can see <clears throat> how he got these people pissed off, right? <laughs> according to his story. <laughs> Listen. This, however, was too much for the long-suffering woman, and she slaughtered the sheep, supposing that she might now feel herself secure in full possession of the meat but wide of the mark Aaron appeared and basing his claim on the Torah demanded the shoulder the two cheeks and the maw alas exclaimed the woman <clears throat> the slaughtering of the sheep did not deliver me out of thy hands let the meat then be consecrated to the sanctuary Aaron said everything devoted in Israel is mine it shall then be all mine <clears throat> he departed taking with him the meat of the sheep and leaving behind him the widow and her daughters weeping bitterly. Such men, said Korah, concluding his tale, Moses and Aaron, who passed their cruel measures as divine laws, pricked on by speeches such as these, Korah's herd appeared before Moses and Aaron saying, <clears throat> excuse me, hold on y'all. I'm almost done. I got a few more sentences. Okay. He departed, taking with him the meat of the sheep, and leaving behind him the widow and her daughters weeping bitterly. Such men, said Korah, concluding his tale, are Moses and Aaron, who passed their cruelty measures as divine laws. Pricked on by speeches such as these, Korah's herd appeared before Moses and Aaron, saying, Heavier is the burden that ye lay upon us than that of the Egyptians. And moreover, as since the incident of the spies, we are forced to annually offer as a tribute to death 15,000 men. It would have been better for us had we stayed in Egypt. They also reproached Moses and Aaron with an unjustified love of power, saying, Upon Sinai, all of Israel heard the words of Yahuwah, I am thy Lord. When therefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of Yahuwah, they knew no bounds in their attacks upon Moses. They accused him of leading an immoral life and even warned their wives to keep far from him. They did not moreover stop short at words, but tried to stone Moses when at last he sought protection from Yahuwah and called to him for assistance. He said, I do not care if they insult me or Aaron, but I insist that the insult of the Torah be avenged. If these men die the common death of all men, I shall myself become a disbeliever and declare the Torah was not given by Yahuwah. Okay, so we're going to stop here. And it's about to start talking about how this death that they die is going to be so unnatural, it's going to blow your mind. Right? So we're going to pick that up tomorrow listen yeah we're gonna pick that up tomorrow listen i read this last one again he said they did not moreover stop short at words but tried to stone moses when at last he sought protection from yahuwah and called to him for assistance 
He said, I do not care if they insult me or Aaron, but I insist that the insult of the Torah be avenged. If these men die the common death of all men, I shall myself become a disbeliever and declare the Torah was not given by Yahuwah. So they should have known something, something was about to come for them, right? All right, beautiful people. So that was our reading for today. We read, we read uh, Deuteronomy 13, 14, and 15. And we read The Legends of the Jews, page 328 all the way to page 331. Read ahead if you want to. I would encourage you to read ahead, right? That way you might have some questions or something. We can chit-chat afterwards. So with that being said, let's go ahead and do the blessing for today. Remember, y'all, if y'all... Y'all probably missed it at the beginning when I was talking about the movie The Da Vinci Code. Go back to the beginning um, when this is over and listen to what I say about that. Then y'all should go watch it. Go watch it if you get a chance. Okay. The blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22. Oh, I keep clicking off of it. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I kept clicking on the wrong thing at the top. That's why. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. And remember the Nazarite vows, the first 21 verses. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, May Yahuwah bless us and keep us. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Okay. Let's the questions. What version of the Bible are you reading from? The NLT, the New Living Translation. Somebody asked me that yesterday so they were watching the video. But I'm reading from the New Living Translation and wherever i see the generic term of yahuwah it would the generic term of god or lord i replace it with yahuwah's name so some people are like well what bible is got no i just understand that they're generic terms like if you read the beginning of your bible in the preface and the introduction it tells you that they remove the name of yahuwah and put a general term there so i undid what they did so when we hear it you can hear it with yahuwah's name um. Please say more about your turkey comment. Turkey is unclean. That's it. We should be eating it because it's a, a vulture. That was it. <laughs> and that's what you asked. I know the world has said, oh, you switching over from this, go to Turkey. No, they take you from bad to worse. It's, it, especially if you Israel. If you Israel eating turkey, you are wrong, my friend. Stop eating it. Like, when I was still eating meat, I figured, well, I didn't figure it out before I stopped eating meat because I had, I was trying to wean myself down. I stopped eating, like, the harsh meats. Like, I first stopped eating pork. Then I stopped eating, um, <clears throat> I stopped, well, I was, I stopped eating a bunch of red meat, but I was still, you know, I have burgers every now and again or whatever. And then I kind of went from that and was only eating chicken and fish and uncle nathan the bible is the source read the bible <laughs> so i wasn't saying that like you know but i'm saying the bible is my source right you gotta look up the turkey the turkey it's a vulture you know um so but if you you can you can read we actually read it in today's reading um i think it was deuteronomy who we read Fort, was it in 14 it's in one of the chapters uh, uh, i think it is is one of the chapters 14 or 15 where it says but that's not the only place you can read it um through leviticus too but also go do some research into the turkey it's a vulture and i know it yeah i know I had a hard time so but i mean by that time i had i had stopped eating meat already but just knowing it <laughs> after i had gotten after I had learned about it, I just thought about how when I transitioned from some of the harsher things, um, the harsher meats into what I thought was better, um, by going to just to chicken, turkey, and fish, I thought that was better. And it, it was just as bad. It was just as bad. Shalom, shalom. Um, but yeah, that was it. Okay. Mm. Okay, Trina, don't forget to send me that. 
your comment. You said, I'm a movie person. I'm going to send you one I watched recently that, that has bothered me. Okay. <clears throat> and that comment was just, uh, it, like I said, if you missed the beginning when I was talking about the Da Vinci Code and the truth that's in that gosh, I have to go watch it. When we stop this and we about to end this, go back and watch the beginning of this. Like when I, as I'm, before I started doing anything, Trina popped on. And it triggered the movie, and I started talking about that literally right when the video comes on. We talked about that for like the first few minutes, but go watch that, y'all. Go watch that. Um, and if you've seen it already, oh yeah, I've seen it. If you ain't seen it in the last three years, go watch it again. Because if you hear, you can't help but to see it with new eyes now and look at everything that's popping out about it. Okay. Oh, hey, okay, okay, okay. He said, you just thought about me, came to mind. Yeah, we about to go, sis. We about to, we about to roll out because we at the end of the video. But, hey, it's recorded. As soon as it stops, go back and watch it again. All right, beautiful people, that's it. We done the blessing. We did the reading. We did the shimmer. So, uh, we about to get out of here. And my kids is not woke yet. They still sleep. Probably because they stayed up all last night. Oh, bless you, the most holy. So, I'm enjoying some of this quiet time where everybody in the house still sleep. <laughs> it would seem to be. Except for my husband. My husband woke. Um, I'm about to get out of here. Bruce, love y'all. I'll see y'all in the morning. 7, it's Monday. 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Bruce.